Hello, welcome to Reporting the Scriptures. I'm your host, Douglas Sam. I'm excited to have David McCurman with me on the line. He is the Executive Director for the Center of Jewish and Christian uh, Understanding and Cooperation, located in Efrat, Israel. And he is going to share with us some Jewish perspectives. Uh, we're very excited uh, I encourage people to check out his website, check out what they are doing, and to understand that as Christians, when we dive into the Jewish roots of our faith and understand uh, what is going on, uh, we come out richer. We come out understanding uh, where the the Jews are coming from and, and actually how we just might be able to work together. Yeah, we, we do have some differences. We're not going to pretend that we don't. And uh, obviously, uh, we're gonna we're on different ships, and to some extent. But there's so much that we do have in common, and it might be incredibly refreshing to see how it all comes together. Hey, David, we're so glad to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a true pleasure. Now, now your your center. Tell me the website again. I I want to let people know. Uh, the that. website is. Uh, www.cjcuc.com, www.cjcuc.com. Now, if, uh, let's say, it's, you know, a pastor or somebody was planning a trip to Israel, would they be able to schedule a time with you and your, your center to come out there and to be enriched? Sure. You can always contact us at info at cjcuc.com, uh, info at cjcuc.com. Awesome. Now, and, and what kind of, you know, what, what would they expect if they were to, you know, go hang out with you guys? I mean, what happens there? So usually um, many groups that come to us are seeking Hebraic roots of their faith. Uh, what we try to do is create positive communication between Jews and Christians using Scripture as a platform for that, since we both believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We believe our common scripture is the word of God, and we believe in that ultimate moment where the world will recognize the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Unfortunately, the synagogue and the church have been divorced from one another, and it's been some bad blood between both our faith communities, and we never really had a conversation, especially from the Orthodox Jewish community toward the evangelical world. Uh, you know, In the last uh, 45 years of Jewish-Christian dialogue, Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Jews chose not to be part of it, um, and then evangelical, evangelical Christians were really never invited to the table to begin with. So mm. that was a very unique dialogue where we have the evangelical Christian world in alliance with the next Christian world right now in advancing something that's unprecedented in, in history between both faith communities. So we believe that uh, the way to approach dialogue is through Scripture, and, and by that we then understand both our mindsets in order to positively communicate with one another. And what do you think is like one of the main barriers when it comes to the scriptures? Is it as a matter of, you know, some of the vocabulary that we're using? We call it, we call it uh, church ease, uh, you know, and, and of course uh, sometimes when we hear the, the rabbinic or the, let's call it the, the, you know, the Jewish vocabulary, it doesn't necessarily resonate in the Christian mind. Uh, is that one thing that you guys try to overcome? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's a, first of all, there's a misconceived notion that uh, when rabbis quote rabbis, we're putting doctrines of men above the Word of God, and that is just simply not true. You know, many of the rabbis that interpret Scripture are using Scripture to explain Scripture, and in addition to that, have received revelation, if you believe that that the uh, Sinai uh, covenant didn't stop at Sinai, but it's a continuing revelation process, as Jews believe in, uh, then you're always going to get a new, fresh perspective into Scripture. However, we do have in Judaism the issue of copyright infringement, that we don't take someone's idea and put it under our own name. And therefore, you know, what was said before us, we want to give respect to and then source it. And that's the reason why rabbis usually go ahead and quote scripture. But uh, once the rabbi does that and the Christian audience hears that and doesn't hear the scripture behind it necessarily because the rabbi is not starting off that way, there's or, there is a defense mechanism that goes up from the Christian world saying, oh, those are doctrines of men, red alert, red alert, uh, 
nice to hear from you, but I'm not going to really accept what you're going to say. Uh-huh. So that's, that is, that usually what, what happens when you're trying to deal with that. So what we have done in our Bible sessions is really mu- pretty much taking rabbinic thought and Christian ease it in a way that it becomes more powerful for, for the Christian process um, when it comes to scripture. So you won't hear sort of rabbis being quoted at the beginning of everything. We, we just, we, it's a very hard thing what we do because I, as a, as an Orthodox Jew, uh, you know, in that culture, we're always constantly going in and quoting rabbis. What I have to do is sort of unlearn what I did in order to present it to the audience because the whole purpose of doing this is to create positive dialogue. We want to mm-hmm. get the message out and not get caught up in the, in the tangents of it all. So that's, that's what we try to do. And then on the flip side of things, um, Jews are unaware of the so scriptorian perspective of, of Christians, you know, especially when it comes to whatever is hidden in the old is revealed in the new. Mm-hmm. Well, if I, if my Bible only contains what is known as the Old Testament chronologically numbered differently than, than the Protestant Bible, right. um, and I don't have the apostolic teachings known as the New Testament, then I'm going to go ahead and, you know, find out how did you get to your conclusions. So, for example, let us make man in our image. Obviously, from a Christian perspective, you're going to say us has Jesus in it. And the reason why is because you have verses that tell you that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. He was there from the beginning of the world. So, therefore, the us has to be that. But that only makes sense if you have this teaching, whatever is and then the old is revealed in the new. If I don't have the apostolic teachings as part of my canon, then I think you're stuffing Jesus into verses that don't belong. And then I get petrified when you're going ahead and, and, and actually interpreting these certain verses to be Jesus. Does that uh-huh. make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, it does. It's interesting. Uh, it really is. Um, you know, I, I really believe that uh, as Christians, we should spend a lot more time in the Hebrew Scriptures a.k.a. the Old Testament. Uh, of course, it's neither old. Uh, I mean, it's not old. It, it's, it's very much relevant. And, you know, I think something that my Christian brothers uh, often overlook is that, you know, Jesus and Paul and Peter, when they talked about the Scriptures, when Paul said all Scripture is God-breathed, he wasn't referring to the New Testament. He was referring to the Hebrew Scriptures, that is, the Old Testament, uh, because those were the scriptures that they had, you know that that's that was their foundation of all that they had. And I I come to the New Testament uh, with the, maybe the exception of the Gospels and the Book of Acts, but uh, the rest of it, the letters, are basically a commentary on on the Hebrew Bible. And you know, I yes. think we understand yes, it that with way. The, with with the ad with the added caveat that they're they're looking at it through a risen Christ perspective. Right. Yes. That's very yes. important to add in that because that's you know, especially with Paul, he his encounter with Jesus has you know, has has a special significance in regard to the way he's going to interpret the Old Testament, which I would call Tanakh. Not necessarily is that going to be involved with the rest of Pharisaical Judaism, which I'm a modern day Pharisee of but we, yes, you're correct. They're they're interpreting the commentary of the epistles is from the Tanakh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, um, and, you know, it's interesting. I, I've studied the, the Targumim, and they talk about this intermediary called the um, the Memra. And uh, do you, have you studied much on the Memra? Do you, are you familiar with that and what this concept is? Yes. Uh, well, again, the Targum, the, again, the Targum came in a specific time. Uh, there right. are some people that say that the Targum was, you know, finally canonized in, in the 4th century um, A.D. Uh-huh. Uh, and some people will say, no, Targum, you know, was actually, you know, Second Temple period. There is an argument, and what, which Targum in, which Aramaic translations are we talking about? At right, the end right. of the day, Jews are going to go ahead and look at the Targum as the prime and prime translation of the Bible, except the translation of the Bible. Whereas the Septuagint, which was a prior translation, the Greek translation of the Bible, there is this tradition that we don't necessarily go ahead and accept it as translation. 
And one okay. of the reasons is is because uh, the Septuagint was a way to replace the Hebrew Bible. And therefore, the consensus was if it came as a replacement without looking at the original text, huh. then um, it's, that's problematic because the Hebrew words are very, so nuanced in translation that you always need that. And the Septuagint right. came in as, a, as, as, as intended to replace the Hebrew where the Aramaic translation was always about making sure we know what the Hebrew stands for. And that's the reason why the Aramaic was accepted within Judaism. Right. Yeah, it was to accompany. But, of course, it it went beyond being just a translation. It became an interpretation uh, in many places where they're, you know, adding things that are not specifically in the Hebrew text. Uh, Maybe they're alluded to. And and that's what I find so interesting. Right. Depending which Targumen we're talking about, and you're specifically probably dealing with Targum Jonathan. Yeah, where Jonathan. He does Uncle, add a, yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is a later Targum than the Targum Funklus that uh-huh. we're usually referring to as Jews when we're dealing with the Bible to Moses and its translation on a weekly basis that we read in the Bible. Uh, right. When it comes to the prophets, there are a lot of, yes, then Targum Jonathan comes in and adds interpretation. And there is always this concept of Mamra, you're correct, uh, lessening the, this is intended by Unclus, it's lessening the physicality of God in, in the world, because Jewish belief is that God has no physicality whatsoever. Okay. As accepted tradition. Right, yeah. Of course, you know, as a Christian, to, you know, to me it sounds like the Logos in John chapter 1, Right. So, I mean, that's kind of one of the, the interesting contentions is that, you know, that the memra or in Hebrew would be devar. You know, this is the this is that intermediary between, uh, you know, Hashem, yud he and uh, the world. You know, we'd say, well, oh, that's Jesus, you know. So uh, how how does the, the, the Jewish community, look, uh, you know, approach the, the memra, if, if at all? Well, again, uh for us, God's Word is a manifestation of God, not equal to God, just a manifestation. It is used as a way to go ahead and create the world. We believe that the, uh, the Torah was the blueprint for creating the world. So everything he says happens through the main rot, and, it, it's, and everything is created through that. But at all, we would say that the Torah was created before, very much in line with Christian understanding that the Torah was created before the world. Otherwise, you can't understand John one one. Right. Yeah. Whether I agree with whether I agree with uh, the concept of that there is a physicality of God through the humanity and divinity of Jesus doesn't take away from the fact that right before that step, here yeah, we have what we have in agreement is a logos, and that right. logos did create the world, a hundred percent. Okay. But we're never going to agree as far as, you know, the divinity of Jesus. And, you know, this is our mystery. This is one of those things that I don't debate Jesus to anybody. I accept you as a Christian who believes this, as Jesus is divine and Savior. And I believe yeah. that your faith is salvific for you. That's fine. And I, I don't, it's not my intention to rip somebody's faith apart because I, I, my tradition doesn't accept that. That's, right. that's the mystery. You're around. Christianity's been around for almost 2,000 years. You brought the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the four corners of the world. We right. owe a special debt to you for that. Even though it was sometimes at the at the uh, the lines of some uh, of the synagogue. But that that's the purpose of dialogue today. That we understand what happened in the past, but in order to have a fulfilling future that represents the kingdom of God on earth, then we need to work together. Right. Absolutely. Well, again, you know, I mean, the, the point here isn't to uh, sweep all the differences under the rug, but if we can accentuate, uh, you know, what we do agree on. And I think so often if we can just have a, this dialogue, which you guys are, are obviously spearheading, I think it's wonderful. And I just want to let people know that uh, I had the opportunity to go uh, to Israel in 2010. Uh, I did live there for three years from 1997 to 2000. I was at the Hebrew University, but went back in 2010 and um, uh, I, I got to take a class that I was teaching to that center and it was just wonderful. I mean, you guys showed us such a wonderful time 
Uh, you gave Thank us you. lunch. You took us on a tour. Uh, we we learned so much, and I, I just thought it was fantastic. Um, so, you know, again, if there's somebody out there that is uh, has a church group that's thinking about going, definitely contact David Nekrutman and the uh, Center for uh, Jewish Christian Understanding and 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 um, Dialogue. Is that right? I'm sorry, I should and know that better. Uh, there you go, cooperation. Sorry, uh, but um, you know it's really just a, a wonderful program that you guys have going. Now, uh, why don't we talk about um, you know the the uh, the unpardonable sin? I mean, this is one of these things. Uh, in Christianity that, uh, you know, people have you know, a lot of fear about, there's a lot of questions. Uh, has this come up for you when people come out over and say, you know, what is your understanding of this? Well, the reason um, it's come up in, in my life right now is because I'm taking a master's in Christian theology at Oral Roberts University. And actually, I am writing about the unpartable sin. If there's any Hebraic roots, to that concept of unpartable sin. I think what's important about the verse, first of all, is that all sins are forgiven. I think that's a, an, amazing, an amazing statement. And the question is, before you go to the unpartable sin, can we first figure out you know, what the concept of all sins are forgiven first comes in? Okay, so basically, you know, so we would say from a Jewish point of view, of course all sins are forgiven. There are biblical examples of that. You have David with the sin of Bathsheba, and he's forgiven. Even though there are consequences, consequences are always there. Sin yes, doesn't, yes, you know, yes. forgiveness doesn't necessarily take away the consequence of your sin. You know, when you have, when someone commits adultery and, there, and there's a pregnancy involved in that, that's a consequence. You might be forgiven for the sin, but the consequence is still there from, from what happened. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Like Mo, like Moses, we'll give you an example of Moses. Whether you agree that he couldn't go into the uh, to the promised land because he hit a rock, or there was a less of a sanctification because you know uh, because he didn't hit the rock, or basically he was pres- pres- very presumptuous of putting himself as God in in those verses and not putting God at all in in the entire act. Whatever it is, at the end of the day. Uh, Moses, you know, gets punished. What's kind of interesting is Moses never says, I sinned. He tries to entreat God to, you know, get him into the land, but unlike David, he never says, in Hebrew, I have, I have sinned. Uh-huh. So I think it's a very important thing to understand that, you know, part of forgiveness is confession. Right, Absolutely. Yeah, which is, you know, so far we're in commonalities with one another that you do need to acknowledge the sin in okay. order to go into this process of forgiveness, however right. confession looks like. So what you do see is even Manasseh, who is probably one of the most wicked kings in Israel, yep. at the end of his life he he does repentance and that and God forgives him. Now the consequences yep. of his actions was terrible to the point that. Jews totally lost their memory of what Judaism was before Manasseh came in. That's the consequences. And that helped, that hurt the Jewish nation. But you do see that he sincerely wanted God to forgive him, and he regretted what he did. So Jesus' statement that all sins are part of law is pretty much in the context of his own Judaism of the day. And even the rabbis in the Talmud always say that a person can go ahead, no matter what time in their lives, has the opportunity to ask God for forgiveness. And if they truly want God to, to, you know, they truly repent of their sin, God does bestow forgiveness. There's even a statement in the Talmud that a person at the end of his life can go ahead and ask for for God's forgiveness, and it's granted even though his entire lifestyle was very wicked. But that moment of sincerity is there. Truth, he, truva, he does that return back to God. Mm-hmm. So it's, it was part of the Bible, part of the Judaism during Jesus' day, and therefore that statement that all sins are forgiven is pretty much in his Jewish uh, culture and belief system. Yeah. Now comes the interesting part where he says, but there's one sin 
that's not forgiven. Now, in Jew- now I'm not going to go to the Jewish answer to that. The question comes up is, what does that mean? What does is, what is, you know, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit actually mean? And mm-hmm. early church tradition basically said, if it, you, you know, if you curse the Holy Spirit, you just, the typical blasphemy that was the early church father, fathers, they said that was sinful. Many people are quite scared of that because there are people who do go ahead and curse, and does that mean that, you know, that sin is always stamped on your soul or not? Then later on, traditions came in within church history, and then they looked at the verses differently and said, no, hold on one second. What's going on in the verse here? It's not simple blasphemy. There are certain things that was happening. Here was certain pharisaical leadership going ahead and choosing what Jesus was doing in his healing and actually going ahead and putting it and saying, that is not from God, that is from the devil. Uh-huh. So, yeah. And Jesus doesn't say, you guys are not forgiven. He's saying, if you're saying that, be careful because that's enough. He's not saying right now they're not forgiven. He's saying, if you continue in that, then you're not forgiven. He's sort of uh-huh. giving them a warning. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad it's very that. interesting. Right. It's a, it's a warning. It's not a condemnation yet. And you have to pay attention to the words because all synoptic gospels mm-hmm. point out the unpardonable sin and it's very much in the context, not so much of blasphemy, because blasphemy, he says, all blasphemies will be forgiven. There's a specific type of blasphemy of going in and saying, whatever you think, you're saying whatever this is, it's not God. It's something of the devil. Well, hold on one second. When you do that, you're preventing a lot of stuff from happening. Right. And you're now in, and you're putting yourself in the position of not allowing, uh, people to see the glory of God through the miracle of itself and might be influenced by that in order to come to God. Right. Yeah. And if you, and if you, you did, you know, it's kind of like if the doctor comes in and says, look, this is your, this is the treatment for your sickness. And you say, no, I, I refuse that. Well, then there's no hope for you. Right. So, you know, if Jesus is saying, look, you know, I'm the way, the truth and life. I know you don't necessarily hold to that, but if that's true, and they are denying that and saying the very power that Jesus is exercising is coming from the devil, then what hope is there? Because what, what more could he possibly do? What, what greater miracle could he possibly show? Right. So there I would say, before you go into the conclusion uh, of what you think Jesus is doing to show off himself, I think you have to go back and say, wait, wait, wait. Miracles and healing was very common in Judaism. That we can say very much Hebraic roots. Uh-huh. And those miracles and things were supposed to go ahead and help others to acknowledge God. Doesn't mean that, you know, you have to take what it means. It's here it is, this is what's going on. I think the issue here is attributing something that's divine and saying, no, it's from a dark force. I think for me, that's the issue. It's not an issue of of showing off Jesus. So there are many people, listen, Je- you know, Peter denies Jesus three times, right? He even prophesied that. There are many people who are, who come to Jesus and are not going to recognize who Jesus is, and he even makes this very much a secret part of his ministry. So there's, and he even says in those verses in the, in the Unpardonable Sin that even if you don't recognize me, you know, you will be forgiven, which is also very interesting. You can blaspheme me against God, you will be forgiven. But the attribution of going ahead and saying what the miracle is, is the problematic issue. And, right. and attributing that to God, but attributing it to something the opposite of God, complete darkness. Right. To me, that's the no. issue. It's not so much yeah. uh, of whether you know, someone acknowledges Jesus there, because Jesus in the same verse actually says, well, if you don't recognize me as a son, don't worry, you'll be forgiven. So the issue is not recognition. The issue is the attributing of what's happening here to something totally to the contrary where it stems from. Mm-hmm. That would be what? my take on it after, after studying all, <laughs> for many weeks on this issue. I know yeah. I am. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, if, you know, again, if you, if you deny the very treatment that is, that is offered, then there is no more hope. If, if, the very miracles that you see that are authenticating the message of Jesus, and you're saying, no, these are from the devil, 
then even if he were to come and do some other miracle, you still wouldn't believe, you know, in the case of the Pharisees, of course. And uh, right. you know, basically there'd be no hope. So, yeah, I don't think it's just, you know, you know, saying words against the Holy Spirit. I think it's the action of of what you're doing. So that's really cool. What does Judaism uh, believe about the Holy Spirit? I mean, there is a lot of talk about Ruach HaKodesh, uh, but what is, you know, what is the Jewish understanding of this Holy Spirit? What is that? The Jewish understanding of the Holy Spirit is obviously going to, so we have to break it down first to understand where Christianity is coming from in, in the Holy Spirit. So Christianity has, you know, basically said the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, co-equal, co-eternal, both to the Father and to the Son. It's also the operating mechanism to access God. It's this thing that's out there so I can have that access with God. And then, obviously, within charismatic, spiritual Christianity, Holy Spirit is used to go ahead and help in healing and performing miracles. Um, so that not, not all Christian denominations believe in healing and miracles. I just finished my Church History two class at Oral Roberts, and, you know, very much when the you know, Spirit-filled movement was beginning, many other Christian denominations, you know, felt these were holy rollers, and that's a negative term. In Christianity when it first came out. So, again, the, what we're seeing now within spiritual Christianity is Holy Spirit is used to go ahead and help out in miracle ministry work. And that's fine. But, in Judaism, what I would say is that the Holy Spirit is a manifestation of God. Actually, we would believe that is our access point. When we read the Word of God and we get this revelation about the Word and a certain interpretation, we would say that is the Holy Spirit. When the prophets were going ahead and giving um, their their uh, things on Israel, and well, that's for all from Holy Spirit. Not, not co-equal, co-eternal to, to God in a sense on the Christian aspect of things, but definitely a manifestation of God, similar to the memory of what we talked about beforehand, God's Word. So... That's from a Jewish point of view. And I'm actually going to be writing a thesis on, on the Hebraic roots of the Holy Spirit once I get through uh, my, master class, my master course classes. Well, in Genesis 1-2, it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. Uh, right. Is that, is that the Holy Spirit? And, and if it is, what, right. what, like, what is that? Um, so we would say, we would say that yes, and definitely there are some rabbis that would, would say, would argue that is not a Holy Spirit, it's something else, but we don't have time to go into that, but there are rabbis that would say, yes, that is the manifestation of God on earth to go ahead and then execute the plan of making the world. And that mm -hmm. this is part, accessing God is access, accessing him via the Holy Spirit but not equal to the Father. That would be the difference between uh, Judaism and Christianity when it comes to this. Okay. So, I mean, basically, it's kind of like, um, you know, if I look at myself in the mirror, you know, it's, it's my reflection, but the reflection isn't, isn't absolutely me. Is that kind of the idea? So this, you know, the Holy Spirit that's a, is... Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's, it's coming from God, but it's not, it is not, it is not God. Okay, gotcha. And if you're the, kind of saying that... I can, give, I can give you an example. I mean, um, when the 13 attributes, after the, after the Jewish people sin with the golden calf, right. and God, God goes ahead and, and, and basically forgives them. Right, there's the in, the in, uh, the thirteen attributes: God, God, you are merciful, compassionate, slow to anger. These are all manifestations of God's attributes in the world. Because mm -hmm. if He just came from a sense of justice, which is also a manifestation of God, then we yeah. wouldn't be able to survive. We need His grace and mercy to always outweigh the justice. That's the whole point of grace and mercy. Because if everything right. was strict we would be dead. So that yes. would be the point of going ahead and having God's mercy. But God's mercy, his mercy is not equal to him. It's part of who he is, but it's mm -hmm. not the whole thing. Is that kind of like the seven spirits in Isaiah chapter 11? 
At the seven Similar. spirits. Similar, yeah. Okay. okay. There's seven spirits. All these are manifestations of God. There's, we would call it attributes okay. of God because because we're finite and we don't have, we, we can't really understand the infinite. We have yeah. terms to help us in our in our way of our finite mind to yeah. try to understand God. So we do that via via things that God would want for us to do. We're supposed to be God-like, so we're supposed to have these attributes to our fellow human beings of mercy and yeah. grace and love. And uh, so let me see if I understand this. I mean. So Judaism believes in the Holy Spirit, believes that the Holy Spirit comes from God, that it, it's an, an attribute of God, but they, you, know, you would, of course, deny the idea of the Trinity, that you have this three-in-one, where you have three co-equal, co-eternal uh, persons. Uh, and um, so, you know, other than that, you, know, you certainly reject that, but as far as the Holy Spirit being from God doing the or executing the will of God the Father or of you know God. Hashem, you know, I mean you wouldn't say the Father. Is that the is that right? Sure. Okay. Yeah, we would definitely believe in that. Yeah. Now in Isaiah forty eight sixteen, it says, And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Um you know, it it's interesting it sure sounds like uh, it, it really sounds to me, it sounds like you have Hashem and you have his spirit that are sending. I mean, I acknowledge that the, the verb in Hebrew is singular. So, right. you know, but what do you do with the Ve'ruho? What is the, the, and his spirit, uh, what there, what is, have you thought about that? I don't know. Maybe I'm putting you on the spot, but just and I question. I know you. Uh, no, well, I, I, I'm gonna say, and it's basically when you're dealing with prophetic writings, and for yeah. the, um, and for the prophet to put it into a cohesive way of uh, getting his message over, often it's in a way of humanity's language. And therefore, this is the way that he operates with that. Indeed, the spirit, to say the spirit again, the spirit is sending it. That's correct. Just like I would say to you, listen, I ended up here. I really don't know how I ended up in place A. Boy, but I am very lucky that I did end up in place A because I met so and so. I wasn't intending to do that, but it happens to be that I, the spirit led me into that direction. Uh -huh. There are many instances that we have in our own life that God sends forth his spirit to us to point us in a direction that we need to go. The question is, are we listening to that voice uh -huh. or not? Yeah, and sure. So if you're, if you're believing in God, then you need to fine tune your hearing to allow that voice to be in you. So again, I'm not, I'm not Isaiah. I'm not on the level of Isaiah, but Isaiah right. and and Jeremiah and all these other prophets are being filled with a Holy Spirit and they are being sent. And that Holy, we would say that Holy Spirit is not equal to God the Father, but it is part of how he gets his message through. Interesting. And, I mean, you know, and we look at and, it. And the, Trinity, yeah. and the Trinity at the end of the day is also a mystery to Christianity. No matter yeah. how you're going to try to work it out, the best of right. theologians at the end are going yeah. to say it's a mystery. And I know the right. whole thing of, you know, the water and the ice and the, you know, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, that, that, that concept of the Trinity, the whole breakdown of it. But at the end, yeah. the dynamics of how it works in a, in a co-equal, co-eternal dynamic yeah. is mysterious within Christianity. And that's fine. Yeah. That's okay. You know, the whole thing of how God operates here at the end is also a mystery. This whole life is a mystery. But, Thank God for his word. Thank God yeah. that he loves us. Thank God yes. he cares about his, his creation. And what we're here to do is to be his divine agents and bringing down the kingdom of heaven to earth. Right. Okay, so again, to recap, I mean, you believe in the Holy Spirit. You don't assign him a, a unique personality as we do in the church. Um, Correct. You be you believe in this thing called the membra or the logos in Greek, uh, to borrow a term, Hebrew, the devar, some kind of a intermediary force 
as spoken of in the the Targumim, um, but you wouldn't assign him the equality of Hashem. Um, Correct. So, I mean, for you and for Judaism, who is Jesus? I mean, who is this guy that showed up on planet Earth 2,000 years ago? So that's a debate within a Jewish thought. It goes from being false messiah to failed messiah to great teacher uh, to some believing in his messiahship only without divinity. Right. Okay. Then there are people who would say messiahship with a low crystal, uh, Christology and then messiahship with a high Christology. Your biggest believer and probably the most Christological of all, everyone within that ch early church would probably be Paul. Right. Okay? I don't know that you can equate Paul to Matthew or Mark. I don't know. There's debate on that. But definitely, you know, Paul sees something very different than the rest of everyone else. His personal oh, okay. encounter, his interpretation of the risen Jesus through that encounter took him to a whole new thing that he became the apostle to the Gentiles, and he has a whole new message to interpret within what his encounter gave him. There are many Greeks and Jews who had an encounter, but never never came to that conclusion that Paul did. I'm not wow. trying to divide Jesus and Paul. Just saying, you have to if you're believing that it's a commentary, that the epistles are the commentary, and Paul is one of the major interpreters of of Christianity, even though I don't think Agreed. he intended to create a church. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. There's a lot of baggage there. I, I, I'm, I'm on board with you there. So, I mean, okay. it, it does get sticky. So, uh, you know. We'll, we'll I would even to... add, I, I would even add, because I just went through a whole Romans class at ORU. It was a very difficult class for me, personally, in a journey <laughs> in Jewish Christian relations. Okay. I was a modern day Pharisee and my Judaism and my my Torah was getting beaten up. And that's fine. You know, sometimes uh -huh. you need your bubble to be burst because a lot of times when I'm engaging in Jewish Christian relations there is sort of this we you know, understanding of course the Torah is relevant and of course this is relevant, but not always is that going to be the mainstream of Christian thought. So right. what's kind of interesting in the in the process of this, a professor of mine uh, gave me uh, Mark Nanos is a take on Paul, and he's a Reformed Jew, and I read his work, and wow, it he brought Paul's Judaism back, and I thought that thank God. I might not, you know, again, I'm not at the end of the day as an Orthodox Jew, I'm not going to agree with Paul's interpretation, but don't strip him of his Judaism, and don't strip yes. him of his Pharisaical Judaism. Yes. Yes. He was a Pharisee. He identifies himself as a Pharisee. He observes the right. law. Right. He sees the risen Christ as as something as a, as a, as a dawn of a new age. A hundred percent. That's yep. that's for sure. But what many Christian commentators did was literally strip Paul of his Judaism yes. and took away the relevance of Torah. And yes. I don't think Paul meant that. And I think what Mark Nanos does, and this is within the whole Sanders. Uh, new school perspective, uh, and Sad now also goes into this. If you bring Paul's Judaism back, then it makes very much sense of what he was trying to do after his encounter. Right. I don't. I don't think. I think what Luther, his interpretation, all to all respect to the uh, uh, the Lutheran Church and the Reformed theology that came from it was six, you know, 16th century problems um, and interpreting uh, Paul accordingly. Yes. And, I don't, and I think you need to go back to Second Temple period and understand Absolutely. what the problems were there and what, and what people, you know, what was the Judaism there. So I totally believe that Paul was a Pharisee, a Pharisee, but not all Pharisees are equal, are the same. That's right. Even in the Talmud, even in the Talmud, there are seven undesirable Pharisee, Pharisaical movements, and uh -huh. they say they're on, they're not desirable because they tend to flaunt their righteousness in front of everybody. They try to show off, because uh -huh. mainstream Pharisaical Judaism at that particular point in time understood 
it's not about me. It's not about my deeds. I come bankrupt before God. I can only rely on God's grace and compassion and his forgiveness. And yeah. what I'm doing, why I keep the, I keep the, I keep the Torah, not law. I keep the Torah as a lifestyle is because God demands holiness. And that was the understanding of Pharisaical Judaism. And I'll give you even a point, even with Paul. Gamiel, he claims that Gamiel is his teacher. He right. stood at the feet of Gamiel. But Gamiel was residing over the Sanhedrin, especially with some of the apostles that you know were brought before the Sanhedrin. And the Sadducees wanted to get rid of these apostles. And Gamiel says, no, 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 don't touch them. And they listen. So here's Gamiel, who could have rendered a decision that would have been, you know, giving the death penalty to, to the apostles. He found within his own Pharisaical Judaism not to come to a conclusion of going ahead and killing somebody based on their belief. And here's Paul as the student who actually becomes a zealot and murders believers. Right. So you can that should give you, like, really an open window to understand that Pharisaical Judaism is not a monolith. I, agree. I totally agree. And, okay. you know, something that I've been exposed to is the idea, well, just this, this debate between the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai, and it was on the question of whether uh, a God-fearer, had, or uh, the Gentiles, let's say, have a part in the age to come if they don't convert to Judaism. And the school of Shammai was saying, no, that they have to convert to Judaism in order to have a part in the age to come. The school of Hillel said, no, they don't have to. And I believe that Correct. is the underlying polemic that Paul is addressing in the book of Romans, in the book of Ephesians, specifically those two. And I think, you know, much of the church has no concept whatsoever of that underlying polemic. And so when Paul is making these arguments about, you know, who can, who's a Jew and and how the Gentiles have co- now come in and are part of the commonwealth of Israel, you know, through the blood of Jesus, um, you know, I, I think, it, I think it, it falls on deaf ears. And um, so, you know, what do you think about that? So I, I, uh, you are hitting upon what I have been, you know, learning recently in scholarship, uh, especially through nanos. Nanos really places Paul in a Shema theology that through his encounters through Jesus, uh, he sees, Paul sees specifically that a new dawn is happening and that if God is a God of Israel, but he's also a God of humanity. And he sees that up until now, the uh, mainstream of Judaism looked at people who believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but did not necessarily convert to Judaism as guests at the table. Uh-huh. What Paul does through his encounter, this is what Nanos is saying, is basically, no, they are given full membership okay, right. into, but full membership equal, but distinct because they still should be nations. If he's a God of the yeah. Jews, and he's a God of the nations, they have to say nations. They should not convert. They should yes. not be demanded to convert, to be forced to convert into uh, Pharisaical Judaism. Mm-hmm. That, that, is a, that is revolutionary, specifically at that time. Right. To go ahead and say you are equal as membership, but distinct as nation. Right. But he only sees that because through, through his encounter. I think that's but, I, you know, at least it stays with, you know, that, he, you know, Paul's a Jew. He's dealing with his own people. He's dealing with several issues here. You have non-Jewish believers in Jesus. You have Jewish believers in Jesus. You have Jewish, uh, Jewish people who don't believe and non-Jews who don't believe. Those are your four categories. He's dealing right. with And each one is going to be addressed within his letter to the Romans and the other in Galatians and Hebrews. And dealing right. with what the ramifications of well, there's a disunity that's happening within the church. One is demanding one thing over the other, over the other. And he's also saying at the same time that Jews who do believe can't all of a sudden say goodbye to their Judaism. They have mm-hmm. to stay for who they are for this to be. Again, that's a very unique perspective. Most most Christians would say when it comes to the weak and the strong in Romans 14 through 15, 
is um, that these are between believers, Jewish versus non-Jewish believers. And Nana says, no, it's actually believers versus non-believers. But that's a whole other, another discussion. But yes, I do, I do recommend if you're going to go ahead and, and uh, use only Christian. The thing is, if you only use Christian commentators, they are putting a spin on Judaism that was that we would we would say, I don't understand how you came to that conclusion. That's not right. Judaism. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, if you were to give us some advice, David. Um, as you know, someone who's in the ch- in the church is a Christian, but wants to grow in their faith and their understanding of not only God per se, but you know Judaism, uh, how to approach things differently. You know, is is there one piece of advice that you could give us, or maybe a couple that that would really help us to to um, see things differently, to get out of our our current paradigm. And to, um, you know, just what you guys are trying to accomplish. I mean, what is one of your main objectives when you, when a group walks away and you say, yes, we did it. What is it that you really want them to walk away with? Um, I, I don't see the thing is I don't expect anything at the end of the day. I don't put an objective or a goal. They're here. I can. You know, I always go ahead and I say, listen, you can have a calling, and I believe this is this is a calling when it comes to standing with Israel and supporting the Jewish people. I think it's a calling, and I don't think that calling, you can take somebody away from that calling. Once you got it, that is it. Once you got the Israel fever, it's always with you, which is great. Okay? However, the dialogue between you and I is on, on another level. And that is very uncomfortable for many people within the Christian Zionist world. Right. To actually dialogue with Jews because it will require getting out of your comfort zone. Right. This is not for the light of hearted. And I always tell Jews, listen, don't get involved in Jewish Christian relations if you don't, if you are not willing to hear the other, truly hear the other. If you're only there to go ahead and give your opinion and state it, then this is not a dialogue. This is, you know, a hearing of some sort, and I'm just going to give you my opinion. Dialogue requires both of us hearing each other. Now, so many, many could come and say, wow, I really learned something. I got a tool I can bring back to my church, a a Jewish way of looking at scripture. Can you really help me in my Bible studies? That's great, right? This is your thing. I'm looking for the dialogue. I'm looking for the raw thing that we're doing right now on radio, that we can actually talk about really controversial issues. We're not going to agree always but we're going to learn through the process. I learned a lot going to, right now going to ORU. I learned so much. I can understand so, so you much, much better. And I've been doing this for 14 years. And I'm still learning. (laughs) Right, exactly. You never stop doing it. I'm still learning. I, you know, again, I would have never discovered Mark Manos. I would have never appreciated. I would have always looked at Paul stripped of his Judaism because that's how, you know, that's the commentators I was using to understand Paul. And truth, truth be, I never understood Paul. I don't. I say I can never relate to Paul, because I would never do these things, terrible things to people, because based upon their belief, I don't find that in my halakha, in my Jewish law. So it was right. very hard for me to relate to Paul. But yeah. in the discovery of it, then you learn, hey, there are Jewish commentators, which is interesting. Jewish scholarship is then reclaiming Paul to to understand. You know, his Judaism to understand what his message was, but it's coming from Jews looking at him, which is very unique. I don't think you can have, have this the same 100 years ago, the way it's happening today. You have tremendous yeah. people in the field, from maybe Jill Levine to Nanos. It's just, it's Boyar and Daniel Boyar and another Jewish theologian. I think yeah. these are people who are sort of blazing the path to serve, you know what? I might not agree with everything that Christianity has interpreted in, in their teachings. That's that's okay, but I'm not going to I'm not going to divorce Jesus at the at the same time. Right. I'm yeah. not going to say, hey, I'm going to you know I'm I'm going to still you know let him be interpreted solely through the eyes of how the Christian interpreters have. Let me bring him into what we we know about Judaism and let our text. 
let our text voice for themselves. I think that if I can, if you say, what can I get, you know, for, for a Christian who encounters with me, is allow Judaism to speak for itself. If you can come away with, you know, you know what, uh, you know, I came with a preconceived notion about Jews, which is normally many Christians have this thing that we're an earn, you know, we're a, um, a work-based salvation religious system, and I'm yeah, bankrolling all my, that. right, yeah. well, I'm bankrolling all my mitzvot in, 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 uh, in, you know, HSBC savings bank, and then at the end of my life, I'm going to withdraw all those commandments and go to God and say, hey, yeah. look how great I am. <laughs> Open up these pearly gates for me, yeah. and that yeah. is not it. I am not. I am. It is so foreign. And then when Christians are, you know, voicing that on me, I'm like, but let me voice it for myself. Let me explain who I am. Yeah. So you can. Can, can I phrase the question? So let me phrase the question so people really understand that. Because last time I had you on the show, I, I asked you the same question, and I, I think this is so important. Do you believe that doing good works gets you into the afterlife? No. Okay. Okay. So you're not trying to very earn simple. God's no. Praise. You're saying I'm you're not, not trying, trying to, to earn, earn God's praise. God's praise. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that's so important because I think 99.9 percent .9 of all Christians, maybe 100 percent, believe that you know Jews are out there. They're doing their meets vote. Their good works. Because they're trying to earn their way into heaven. And we think that's what, uh, you know, keeping the, the commandments is all about. Because they're trying to earn God's favor instead of just grace. And then Christianity does this whole weird thing. Like, well, we're not under law anymore. We're under grace. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Well, which of the Ten Commandments are we really going to throw out? I mean, are we going to go out and murder? Are we going to go lie and cheat and steal and, and commit adultery? Uh, you know, I mean, the one that people have trouble with is the Shabbat, but that's another topic. But, you know, it's, no, we keep the commandments. Of course we keep the commandments. And Jesus said, if you love your neighbor, you'll do these things. So I, I think what you are bringing up, David, is so fundamentally important. And, you know, if I could, I would encourage you to, to tell you know, every group that comes over, look, we're not keeping the commandments because we have to. We're doing it because God told us to. We're just, you know, we want to please our father, why wouldn't we do that? And these things lead to life, not to death. I, it's such a fundamental misunderstanding about the law. Right. The Torah, the Torah, the instruction booklet. I mean, that's what we're talking about. All right, but then I'll flip the equation around uh, for the Jews. I think our preconceived notion, and Moshe Kempinski from Shurashin, um Shop in the Old City, I want to. I want to give the, because he actually said this, and I think many Jews think this as well. Uh, we think you love salvation more than God. Uh huh. That you okay. love that monopoly card, <laughs> and then when you have that monopoly card, it's like no one else can get in. Then fire insurance. That's it. The fire insurance card. Right. You got it. You love that more than God, and then when yeah. you actually interact with a Christian and you hear how they express their faith, it's amazing. And I'll give you, I'll give you here's a perfect example. N.T. Wright, one of the most prominent theologians within, you know, definitely within the Anglican Church and Reformed Theology. I disagree with everything he says about me. But if you look at him and you see how you express it, his faith, it's, very, it's amazing. It's inspiring. Even though I disagree with everything, I still think he's a replacement theologian. Right. And yeah. he would argue that he's not. But he loves God. Yeah. I, and, yeah. I, and I think, that, you know, even, and, and it's, it's not easy, you know, for, for a Jew to go ahead, oh, he believes in replacement theology, I don't know if I'm going to deal with it. Well, in dialogue, you're going to deal with people that you're going to disagree with. That's part of dialogue. <laughs> so, right. The thing yeah. is, is that Am I coming in with a bias into the dialogue, or can I uh -huh. lessen my bias once I go through the dialogue? Yeah. And what a great appreciation I have for Christians I have dialogue with it. I became a better prayer person because of it. I'll give you, here's a perfect example. I'll give you a perfect example that happened to me last year. And I was at Pastor Joe Olstein. I had a meeting with him, uh, and he invited me to his, his uh, service after the meeting. Okay, so here I am, 
uh, Shabbat afternoon. I'm in the hotel next door to his church. I have a meeting with him. His services is after Shabbat. He, uh, and then he invites me over to the service. And then he has this thing right before he goes ahead and gives his message. He picks up his Bible and he says, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. And he goes through this whole 87 word prayer in essence, a liturgical prayer that he came up with. And at that moment, I had an appreciation of my own Judaism. Because in our liturgy, we, before we ask God for our daily bread and we petition God, we ask God to, be, to have a sweet tooth for his word and that we acknowledge that God is always the revelation of word. He is our teacher. The rabbis and who I learn with are just agents to bring out the revelation they need to in the Word. Yeah. That is what happened when I was at a church listening to this, you know, liturgical prayer that he developed, or his father Uh, developed and he took it. But I think, you know, these are the things, suddenly suddenly you have an encounter, things of, you know, your own liturgy and your own faith you never paid attention to all of a sudden get highlighted because you have the encounter. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I, I, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're we are out of time, but uh, it's, it's, this hour went fast, and I, uh, I really covet uh, this opportunity that that we've had here to talk, to dialogue. Uh, again, you know, everyone doesn't mean that we agree on everything. I mean, we still see things differently uh, on a lot of topics, but. The the fun part is that we can find a lot of common ground and, and conversation, communication is about finding common ground. Uh, that's at the heart of the word there. And so this is what we need to do. We, we've got to find something that we have in common, talk about it, accentuate that. And then a lot of times the differences that we have will so often become much, much smaller. And then they're actually quite manageable. So, David, I want to thank you for, for coming on. Uh, tell us your website one more time if somebody is interested in going over there and studying with you guys. Sure. It's uh, www.cjcuc.com, and the email is info at cjcuc.com, and that email goes directly to me. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much, Todaraba, for being on the show. Uh, much appreciated. I think, uh, I, you know, I've learned. I uh, Appreciate what you've brought to this conversation, and we will have to do it again someday. Everyone, thank you for listening. Stay in the Word. Uh, Be in the the Hebrew Scriptures. There's great, amazing stuff in there, lots of meat, uh, not just milk. So check it out. Until next week, God bless.